Hello and welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 9th of April and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 12th of April and we're coming off the back of another record week for global stock markets. We've seen record highs not only in the S&P 500, that generally tends to be a fairly regular affair, but we've also seen more record highs in the German DAX, we've seen record highs in the stocks 600 and we've also seen record highs in the FTSE 250 as UK stocks finally start to get a little bit of love from investors and the markets more broadly. So you know what does that mean for um, markets in general? Well ultimately we're coming off the back of a fairly benign backdrop when it comes to central banks. There's been an awful lot of concerns in the past few days and weeks about rising inflation risk. Those risks haven't gone away. And obviously last week's bumper payrolls report, 916,000 new jobs with an upward revision to the previous month's number was very well received. More importantly, the unemployment rate fell back as did the underemployment rate. And both ISM reports for March were also broadly very, very positive indeed. That being said, this week's weekly jobless claims numbers appear to be going in the wrong direction. So what does that tell us about the overall risk um, profile of the markets? Well, I think investors are fairly sanguine about inflation risks. And while Fed officials, notably Jay Powell, um, after this week's Fed minutes, have gone on the record as saying that they're going to be very much focusing on the data as it happens and not what they expect to happen. And I think that's very important. They're going to be evidence based. So they're going to wait for the data to improve, see that it's improved before acting on inflationary risk. And as a result of that, we've seen US Treasury yields, 10 year yields fall back down to around about 1.62%. However, Despite all of these warm words, these dovish, the dovish rhetoric and what have you, I think one thing we can take away from the past week or so is that US economic data as we head into April is going to continue to be patchy, it's going to continue to be lumpy. And while the markets will eventually start to price in the possibility of a tapering of asset purchases, we're not there yet. Having said that, where we are a week from now could be a particularly different place to where we are um, as I'm talking to you um, this moment, because in the next week or so, we're going to have a whole host of important economic data, not only from the US, but also from China. And I think, you know, inflation risk invites an awful lot of debate, it invites an awful lot of toing and froing as to whether or not it'll be transitory, which I always find a rather confusing term because ultimately, you know, when, once prices go up, they're not transitory, they're permanent because unless consumers get a pay rise to offset the rise in inflationary pressures, you generally don't find those prices come back down. And if they do, they take an awful lot longer to come down than they do in going up. So, is there an inflation risk out there? Absolutely there is. You're seeing it in supply chains, higher costs there. So um, companies have a choice as to whether or not they choose to absorb that increase in prices and narrow their profit margins or pass it on to the consumer. And that's something that we may get a, ni a nice little insight in um, over the course of the next week because we've got US retail sales for March, which are due on the 15th of April. And we've also got the latest US CPI numbers. Now, um, inflation expectations are rising. Chinese PPI came in at 4.4% um, in March, up from 1.7% on an annualized basis uh, in February. That's a big jump. And if there is a ripple out effect in the global economy from that Chinese factory gate data, then you could well see it in US inflation data over the course of the next few months. So US CPI data will be particularly important, as will Chinese, uh, as will US retail sales data. We've also got the latest China trade, China GDP, first quarter GDP, and Chinese retail sales numbers um, in the coming week as well, as well as the latest UK monthly GDP numbers um, from February. 
Now, in terms of the UK GDP numbers, there's not really that much to see. Um, the UK economy has been locked down. Um, we saw a 2.9% contraction in January, a number which was better than expected, which means that the hope of a slowdown in Q1 is likely to be much less than the minus 4%, which the Bank of England originally penciled in at the beginning of the year. Now, obviously, since then, the Bank of England has revised um, its assessments of the UK economy slightly higher. Um, and um, with, the, with, the, with the recent PMI data that we've seen um, in the past couple of months, there is certainly very much evidence of a sign of a recovery in uh, the UK economy. And you've certainly seen that borne out in the PMI data for March. Obviously, this GDP number will not reflect that. It is due out on the on 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 the Monday. But nonetheless, um, we've seen the pound start to exhibit a little bit of weakness in the past few days on the back of um, recent events. Well, of what some people have been saying has been as a result of the toing and froing over the AstraZeneca vaccine. I myself think that is nonsense. I think the fact that we've seen the pound do so well over the course of the past few months, we were well overdue about of profit taking. And ultimately what we've seen here is a little bit of those longs basically scaling out of their long positions after the failure above 140 and the failure obviously to follow through on the downside on Euro sterling as well. If you're seriously telling me <laughs> that um, Europe is in a better state than the UK at the moment, I'd ask you what you were smoking. Um, because, you know, for whatever faults the UK government has made with respect to the pandemic, and there have been many, uh, the vaccine programme, the vaccination programme hasn't been one of them. And whatever your views on the AstraZeneca um, uh, Virago, whatever you want to call it, ultimately, there's probably more people alive now than would have been if the jab hadn't been administered. And I think that's important to remember when people criticize the AstraZeneca vaccine, of which I had my first jab on the 21st, 24th of March. So um, looking in terms of where we are on the cable, we are finding a little bit of support in and around 136 and a half. And I think while we remain above 136 and a half, then the upside remains intact. And I think that's the important level to really keep an eye out for as we look towards next week. This series of lows through here, I'm going to draw in a line along there. There we go, 136.70, 136.5. That's a really big level um, for the pound against the dollar. Now, it is looking a little bit vulnerable at the moment, and we really, we really do need to see a move back above the 50-day moving average to stabilise. The dollar does appear to be mounting a little a bit of a comeback, and that's one of the reasons why the pound has drifted lower. The euro has also drifted lower as well, um, and you can see that borne out in the euro dollar chart as well. If we look at uh, euro dollar here, we can see it's, a, it's in a similar sort of uh, downtrend. Um, I put a nice little channel line in there. We broke down below the bottom of that channel. We've since moved back above it. We've also moved back above the 200 day moving average. That for me is probably less important now than it was, say, for example, when we broke below it. But what I would say is that with the 50 day rolling over, the next big level on euro dollar at the moment is these two peaks here, which is around about 119.80, 119.90. So if we do squeeze up, it's not going to be much above the 50 day moving average, that's going to be a significant barrier in the short to medium term. So despite the fact that we've seen a little bit of dollar weakness, particularly against the euro, um, I think it's probably going to be fairly short lived and probably a direct consequence as well of a slight softening in US 10 year yields, which has prompted a little bit of what I would call risk on, which sometimes the euro tends to benefit from um, more than it usually does in a scenario such as this. Again, I think um, the, the rebound in the euro um, and um, the, the sell-off in the pound was a direct consequence of 
too many too many euro short positions in euro sterling because you can see this move play out in euro sterling right here very very strong rebound back above this breakout level of 8540 we are we've 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 risen three days in a row we really need to take out this peak here to signal that the short term base for euro sterling is in and at the moment that's my next key chart point on my on my written on my written notes and my daily notes which are, which I send out every morning you can also look at it in the chart forum as well in terms of euro sterling um, when it comes to my daily musings on those currency pairs my daily musings can be found under forums on euro sterling euro dollar cable and dollar yen where i give daily updates along with my analysis on where i think these particular currency pairs might be going and where the key levels are so i mean that's, that's basically that's basically what i'm looking at data wise over the course of the next week or so so we've got china trade um let's have a quick look at the FTSE 100 um we've seen finally finally i talked about it last week when is the FTSE going to break higher and hey voila there we are we've broken higher we've made a new one year high highest levels since february last year still well below the previous peaks of seven six eight nine which we saw in january last year and which i can basically take you back to there 17th of january 2020 um so it's good news we've managed to push above the highs of this january the big question now is whether or not we can sustain these gains going forward certainly i think evidence of a decent first quarter chinese gdp number um could be the catalyst um in terms of prompting a more um robust rebound particularly in the FTSE 100 it's a big week for Chinese data I may have mentioned it before we got first quarter GDP from the Chinese um, economy and earlier this year there was a little bit of consternation about the fact that Chinese authorities set out their GDP target for this year at around six percent now some people were arguing that's too optimistic I would argue it's too pessimistic um, I think if anything given the challenges faced by the global economy over the last 12 months, one could argue it's a little on the conservative side. And we, with respect to a strong rebound in the US economy, the huge amounts of fiscal stimulus that's likely to hit that economy, we could get a much stronger economic rebound, not only um, in the US economy, but more broadly in Europe and in Asia as well. So I think for me, I would I would suggest that there's a good chance that this GDP number could actually come in slightly better than expected. It, you know, setting aside Chinese US trade tensions and um, the amount of stimulus, the wall of stimulus that's about to ripple out across the global economy is likely to manifest itself. And hopefully um, a big jump in the first half of this year. The bigger question is whether or not it's sustainable over the second half. And I think a lot of that will depend on on progress in the vaccination program and obviously variants and the evolution of variants we also have chinese retail sales and again here um, we've seen fairly strong evidence of a rebound in the chinese economy over the course of the past um, six to nine months and that is likely to continue there was no shutdown over chinese new year um, like there was in 2020 so you'd like to think the momentum gained in the first two months of this year is likely to be sustained in two March. So the 16th of April is likely to be a very key day for Chinese economic data and the outlook going forward. We also have China trade data, which should give us a decent indication of how good or bad um, the Friday data will be. So that's on the Tuesday, China trade the Chinese economy finished 2020 on a strong note it got off to a fairly decent start at the beginning of this year and very strong imports in February as well we saw strong rises of exports and imports in February that's likely to be sustained into March so the FTSE 100 broken above 6,900 I'm hoping for that to be sustained going forward and head back and head towards 7,000, which remains, still remains, um, my interim target for the FTSE 100 in the short to medium term. DAX, again, very positive 
week for the DAX, new record highs earlier this week, and not really doing an awful lot, but the direction of travel is quite clear here, higher lows, higher highs. If you want to basically draw in a line to plot the direction of travel when it comes to the lows, I normally just draw in a little line like that just to give a nice little indication. We've also got the 50-day moving average, which could well act as a decent support level. And obviously the initial breakout point of 14,200. But again, you know, the trend is your friend and don't try and pick the top. The, the line of least resistance at the moment for equity markets is to buy the dip. And we've got the FTSE, the, the, the S&P 500, back above another record level, 4,100 at the moment. Um, NASDAQ is looking to retest its previous record highs on the NASDAQ 100, hasn't quite got there yet, and the Dow is lagging behind. This does worry me a bit, the fact that not all US markets are making new record highs. You would like to see um, all US markets doing exactly the same thing. You want the averages the US averages to confirm each other. Now, so I'm paying particular attention to this NASDAQ chart. Can we take out the previous record highs on the NASDAQ? If we can, then I think the S&P 500 rally has legs. If it doesn't, I'd be a little bit concerned about potentially a fake out. Um, and it's a similar sort of story, I think, when we look at the US 30 or the Dow. Again, we've made new record highs. So we're making new record highs on the Dow and the S&P, but we're not really doing it at the moment on the NASDAQ. And I would like to see that on the NASDAQ and the Russell 2000 as well, particularly the Russell, given the fact that it's probably the most, it's the, it's the index that's most closely attuned to the fortunes of the US economy. And we can see that borne out here. There's a nice little sideways consolidation here. And actually, there is a risk here that we could be forming a little bit of a head and shoulders. So I will be paying particular attention to that over the course of the next few days to make sure that we don't break this blue support and resistance line here on the Russell. Because if we do, that could be an early warning that perhaps the upward momentum that we're seeing in US markets is starting to falter a little bit. Okay, so that's... Um, so that's US markets. So paying particular attention to US retail sales as well. They're important. And I'll tell you why. The reason they're important is March is the month that the stimulus checks, the new Biden stimulus checks will have hit the mats. And consumer confidence saw a big, big jump in March. And ISM reports were also very strong in March. The payrolls report was very, very strong in March. So what we saw in February was a fall of 3% in US retail sales. Big fall. So you would like to think that maybe that pairing back of spending in February could have been a little bit of uncertainty about what sort of stimulus package would hit the mat in March. The fact that stimulus package has now been delivered could unlock quite a lot of US consumer spending. So at the moment, expectations around that US consumer spending, that rebound, could be anything in the region of 3, 4, 5%, something like that. We saw January retail sales rebound by 5.3% as a result of the $900 billion stimulus that was passed at the beginning of January um, in, the, um, in, the, in, in the twilight zone or the, the, the closing the closing days of the Trump administration. So if a $900 billion stimulus package can prompt a 5.3% rise in January retail sales, followed by a 3% slump in February, it sort of stands to reason you'll probably get a fairly decent rebound in US retail sales in March. And I think that's really the big question is, how big a rebound can we expect to see in terms of US retail sales as we look ahead to the March numbers. The estimates are anything in the region of 5.2 or 5.3%. Could come in higher than that. We'll have to wait and see. It's a much bigger stimulus package. But that could certainly um, push up US yields 
particularly if CPI is a strong number and retail sales is a strong number. So keep an eye on keep keep an eye on that. It's also a big week for earnings. We've got a we've got um, Tesco's full, full year numbers, um, and they've done particularly well this year, even though the shares are down one percent as I look at it at the moment. We've also got the beginning of earnings season. J.P. Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs are all posting their first quarter earnings for 2021. Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan on the 14th of April, Morgan Stanley on the 16th of April. And we've all heard about the fallout from the Archegos Capital and the fact that Morgan Stanley was front running the sell off in those particular positions. So I'll be particularly interested in the Morgan Stanley numbers um, in light of the fact that they had such a really good Q4 and a, and a fairly good 2020. A strong Q4 helped drive record numbers with revenues coming in at 13.64 billion, as well as well, you know, two, nearly $2 billion above estimates for Morgan Stanley. The outperformance was driven by investment banking as well as the equities trading division. Now, it's the equities trading division that caused all of these problems with Archegos. So the big question for me is, how much did this Archegos thing cost them? And did it impact revenues in their equities trading division in Q1? How much does it cost the bank? How much does it cost Goldman Sachs? Um, JP Morgan, as far as I can see, wasn't involved, but an awful lot of the growth that we've seen in revenues over the course of the past 12 months has been as a result of an improvement in these US investment banks equities trading divisions. So the recent turmoil could have impacted these first quarter numbers. So certainly keeping keeping an eye on the profit numbers um, and certainly the revenue numbers because uh, the, the previous and the previous results for all of these banks, revenues were very, very strong pretty much across the board. So be very interested to see JP Morgan on the 14th, Goldman Sachs on the 14th and Morgan Stanley. Let's have a quick look at their respective charts. We can see with JP Morgan, we've had a nice little break to the upside, breaking through $140, um, peaking out around about 160. Direction of travel again looks fairly positive, but it does feel a little bit overextended. So maybe we're due a little bit of a pullback there. Having said that, if yields differentials start to widen out again, then they can certainly continue to push ever higher. Same thing with Morgan Stanley here. A nice little uptrend started to tick higher, pretty much shrugged off any concerns that they um, may have had about the Archegos capital. So again, similar story. Last but not least, Goldman Sachs. Here we go. You could argue there's potentially a little bit of a top forming here, perhaps a potential top. We won't know that until such times as we get a little bit of a break below that support level there. So keeping an eye on that for any evidence of a weakening in the overall trend. But overall, um, bank earnings could be a fairly decent arbiter of how well um, this particular move higher in US stocks is likely to play out. Then, of course, we've got Tesco's. Tesco's supermarkets in general have had a fairly decent pandemic, though you wouldn't know it, to look at their share prices. And the reason for that has really predominantly been because of the higher costs um, supermarkets have incurred as a result of employing extra staff and enforcing extra additional safety measures to safeguard their staff. Having said that, they've returned all of the, um, all of the uh, um, government, government help when it comes to job retention scheme and what have you. And um, by and large, they've pretty much outperformed, particularly in the online space where online orders for Tesco's um, have risen 80% over the 19 week period. So 7 million, 19 week period over Christmas with 7 million orders delivered over the Christmas period. So it is still involved in a very much a price war with Aldi, Little, Sainsbury's, Waitrose, M&S Food, um, Asda, but nonetheless, you know, it's a it's a it's a supermarket titan, and not only does it do well in terms of its online, its supermarket, but also its um, booker, um, its booker division as well. Its bank, Tesco Bank, is its main drag, 
losses in the bank are expected to come in between 175 and 200 million. But in terms of expectations for full year profit, um, management expect them to be around about the same level as a year ago pre-pandemic. So that's not too shabby um, when you consider the associated extra costs of taking on new staff and implementing various COVID-19 mitigation measures to protect its staff. So profit a year ago, operating profit a year ago, was 2.5 billion pounds, which after operating costs came down to a more modest, just under a billion. So the fact that they, they're looking at profits around about a similar sort of amount, that's pretty impressive. I'm gonna finish off now with Bitcoin. Um, it's not something that I normally cover, but um, next week is not a normal week because when we look at Bitcoin and when we look at cryptos, cryptos have become ever more popular when it comes to trading in financial markets. And next week, on the 14th of April, Coinbase is IPOing, or not so much IPOing, it's basically issuing shares. It's, 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 it's it's instituting a direct listing. And that is one particular IPO that's likely to generate an awful lot of interest, given how much we've seen with respect to Bitcoin, Ethereum, but also um, decent growth in all of the other small cryptocurrencies like Stellar Lumens, um, Monero, Neo, Cardano, Dash, if you look at our all crypto index or our, our emerging crypto or crypto index on CMC markets, we can see that we've hit record highs on that index. So crypto is becoming ever more popular. You can either get exposure to it by way of the various crypto indexes, the major crypto indexes here on the front end platform for professional clients only, um, or by virtue of Bitcoin itself, which appears to be looking for a move above sixty thousand dollars. So, in terms of Bit in terms of Coinbase, that's expecting to um, float on the Nasdaq, fourteenth of April. Looking at the numbers, it's got fifty-six million verified users. Its latest results showed the company turned over one point eight billion dollars in the first three months of its fiscal year. That's more than the company generated the, over the whole of 2020, when it generated revenue of $1.3 billion. In terms of trading volumes, the last quarter saw turnover of $335 billion, with assets on its platform rising to $223 billion, with $122 billion of that coming from what they called institutional users. Now, obviously, there's an awful lot of hype um, when it comes to cryptos. Bitcoin and what have you. Um, there are significant risks when it comes to cryptocurrencies, regulation being one of them. So um, as a result of that, Coinbase didn't provide any guidance when it came to its outlook for the year, calling or citing the inherent unpredictability of its business. And I think that's at the real core of it. That's the real crux of it. Um, the company outlined three separate scenarios for the, year, for the year, with the most optimistic scenario predicting around 7 million monthly users. It currently has around about 6.1, so that's a slight increase. So, as I say, just to finish up, uh, Coinbase IPO on the 14th of April. It's going to be a fairly, fairly, fairly busy day on the 14th of April because obviously we've also got um, Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan's earnings. Um, as, as well as um, a whole host of other interesting items to wade through for next week as well. But that's it. I think I've probably gone on for way too, way longer than I expected to. So I'd like to thank you very much for listening and wish you all a very pleasant weekend. And I will speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thanks a lot and have a nice weekend.